Welcome to Mormon Facts. The people that know a lot about psychedelics don't usually know a lot about Mormon history. And the people that know a lot about Mormon history don't usually know anything about psychedelics. So it's no surprise that our understanding of psychedelics' role in early Mormon history has been largely overlooked. Early Mormon experiences were replete with visions, trances, wallowing on the ground, shouting, weeping, laughing, contortions, prophecies, and speaking in tongues. These descriptions provide a sharp contrast to the modern LDS Church, which teaches that religious ecstasy is achieved by folding your arms and being quiet. So what was happening during the 1830s that made those experiences so frequent? In this video, we're going to explain how a plausible explanation could be that early Mormon members were experiencing the effects of psychoactive substances. This video was brought to you by the podcast Zion. Zion is a podcast telling the story of the early Mormon church, told through a narrative historical fiction audiobook format. We'll discuss more about Zion at the end of this episode. So what evidence is there that early Mormons may have taken psychedelics? The year the church was founded in 1830, the infant faith began to develop a reputation of providing its members with Pentecostal, frenzied spiritual experiences. This wasn't completely abnormal, as Shakers and Quakers were at the peak of their growth around this time. However, Mormons took that Pentecostal religious exuberance to a new level. In Kirtland lived a medically trained school teacher named Jesse Moss. Jesse had heard rumors of wild Mormon sacrament meetings and set out to investigate. He recounts his experience as follows. They partook of the Lord's Supper at night with darkened windows and excluded from the room all but their own till they got through and then opened the doors and called the outsiders in to witness a scene far exceeding the wildest scene ever exhibited among the Methodists. What were these scenes that far exceeded Jesse's wildest imaginations? This is a list of documented accounts of behavior that took place within early Mormon sacrament services. Unnatural distortions, wielding the sword of Laban, sliding on the floor like a snake, sailing in a boat to preach to the Lamanites, unseemly gestures, cramps, collapsing in ecstasy, insanity, being unable to move, and observing balls flying in the air. Jesse wrote, The poorhouse in Portage County, Ohio, where there were half a dozen insane and idiotic persons, was the best comparison of anything to the scene that night. Were these people experiencing the glorious ecstasy of God's divine presence? If so, why do Mormons no longer experience these same physical manifestations? Is it that religious experiences have changed? Or is it more likely that something was in the sacramental wine that induced these behaviors? Jesse Moss was so convinced that the wine had been laced, he tried to prove it by attempting to steal a bottle but was caught in the act. He then stated publicly that he became fully satisfied the wine was medicated and that by drinking of it, that angels could be manufactured and strange wonders made to appear in the night. There are hundreds of accounts where individuals describe taking the sacrament and are then rewarded with religious experiences. Notice the cause and effect of these passages, taking of the sacrament followed by religious visions. We partook together of the emblems of the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Many of our members had the heavens opened to their view and beheld Jesus Christ. Bro Joseph promised that the pure in heart that were present should see a heavenly vision, after which the bread and wine was distributed by Bro Joseph, after which many of the brethren saw a heavenly vision of the Savior and concourses of angels. When we partook of the consecrated bread and wine, some testified of having the visions of heaven opened to their view. It's reasonable to ask, is the alcohol in the sacramental wine capable of inducing heavenly visions or spiritual raptures? 
The simple answer is no. Alcohol-related hallucinations only occur after years of abuse and abrupt withdrawal. So what could have been infused within the wine that would have caused this type of behavior? There are a number of psychoactive substances that would have been available to Joseph Smith in the regions where he lived throughout his life. Datura is characterized by a large trumpet-shaped flower and a spiny capsule fruit with numerous seeds within. Datura will make another appearance later on in the video. Various psychoactive mushrooms grow in the eastern United States. Two primary examples are Amanita muscaria and psilocybin mushrooms. Much of Joseph Smith's rural life was dominated by crops such as wheat, rye, and barley. Ergot infects grass and cereal crops. It grows, then falls to the ground. If conditions are correct, the mature floret will germinate, forming several fruiting bodies called ergot stroma. The iconic images of the ergot stroma have appeared within Judeo-Christian artwork throughout history. Physicians in 19th century America were familiar with ergot, as well as Joseph Smith's family. As trade networks within the U.S. expanded, it is possible that Joseph Smith would have come into contact with peyote. At the time of his death, Joseph Smith possessed a seer stone shaped in the likeness of a peyote cluster. While it's not possible to say specifically which psychoactive substances would have been administered to early Mormon members, there are physical reactions to the sacrament that give us some clues. In one account of an early Kirtland sacrament meeting, Joseph Smith alluded to possible mass visions and outright promised Lyman White that he would see Christ that day. White turned stiff and white, exclaiming that he had indeed viewed the Savior. Joseph himself said, I now see God and Jesus Christ. Then Harvey Whitlock turned as black as Lyman was white. His fingers were set like claws. He went around the room and showed his hands and tried to speak. His eyes were the shape of oval O's. Then Lehman Copley, who weighed over 200 pounds, somersaulted in the air and fell on his back over a bench. Similar behavior was manifested by people all day and the greater part of the night. Joseph's use of psychoactive substances did not begin with the founding of his church, but would have begun much earlier in his life. When Joseph was young, his father Joseph Smith Sr. experienced many visions or dreams. So important were these dreams that Joseph's mother Lucy Mack Smith dictated lengthy descriptions. In one dream, Joseph Smith Sr. is led by a psychopomp to a tree whose beautiful branches spread themselves somewhat like an umbrella, and it bore a kind of fruit in shape much like a chestnut burr and as white as snow, or, if possible, whiter. As he watched, the chestnut shells commenced opening and shedding their particles, or the fruit which they contained, which was of dazzling whiteness. When he partook of the fruit, he experienced something delicious beyond description, and invited his family to eat. They got down upon their knees and scooped the fruit up, eating it by double handfuls. Those familiar, will note the obvious comparisons between Joseph Smith Sr.'s visions and that of Lehi's dream in the Book of Mormon. Joseph Sr. describes the fruit of the tree as a spiny, thorny fruit of the chestnut, which is similar in appearance to the fruit of Datura. The use of entheogens would have been culturally taboo during this time, as the temperance movement was just beginning to gain traction in American culture. Maybe Joseph Smith imagined a time when the use of entheogens would become culturally acceptable. Doctrine and Covenants 105.23 reads, Reveal not the things which I have revealed unto them, until it is wisdom in me that they should be revealed. Before you go, I'd love to tell you about my new passion project, Zion. Zion is an audio drama that is published as a podcast. There are scenes, characters, dialogue, and a narrative story. In other words, early Mormon historical fiction. 
The first two episodes start in 1823. Joseph Smith is 17 years old, there's no Book of Mormon and no Mormon church. And yet, during this time, significant events occur in Joseph's life and Zion tells those stories. The stories are written to appeal to everyone, whether you grew up Mormon or have no idea what took place in the early days of Mormonism. Zion is crafted with music and subtle sound effects to more fully immerse the listener in the stories. When Mormon history is told in a narrative story format, it comes to life more than dry facts and dates ever could. You can download Zion on all major podcast platforms. And to make it easier, I've provided links in the description below.